All right, this is the Wolfman, and it's time for the Retro Time Machine, baby, where your host, Jay Jennings, talks to the grooviest cats of the 70s. Now, without further ado, here he is, my main man, Jay Jennings. Hello, and welcome uh, to the Retro Time Machine podcast. I'm Jay Jennings, the show where we discuss all things retro and chat with the grooviest stars of the 70s. Uh, I'm an author and a retro pop culture historian. And today we have a very special guest on the show. It's our third Croft alumni, if you will. He was one of the stars of Family Affair, uh, appeared in a ton of movies and TV shows. But I think he is most beloved, at least in my opinion, and best known for that wonderful, trippy, unique Saturday morning kids show, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, which we will be discussing after we kind of do a This Is Your Life retrospect on his uh, acting career. So please, without further ado, uh, welcome uh, my guest at this time, uh, child star, teen idol, singer, actor, computer consultant, and more recently, addiction treatment counselor, the one, the only, Johnny Winnaker. Hi, Johnny. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the podcast. <clears throat> Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, my first question before we move on to anything else is your middle name is Orson. Was that because your parents were a big fan of Orson Welles, or did you have a favorite uncle named Orson? <laughs> no, actually, it is my great-grandfather's name. He was O.A. Whitaker, Orson Adelbert Whitaker. And um, he was named after a Mormon um, missionary who came to England, uh, Orson P. Pratt. And so that's where I get the Orson. But it is my middle, I, I am John Orson Whitaker Jr. Um, I am the fifth child, but in our family, it was um, my grand, my father's father, his Wilford Woodruff Jr. was their fifth child. So I don't know if it has anything to do with it, but my father's name was John Orson. And so I took my name from my dad and his middle name came from his grandfather, Orson. Oh, okay. That's cool. I knew there was uh, some sort of a cool background to that. Um, you're a local boy, uh, born in Van Nuys, one of eight children to your parents, John Sr. and, and Thelma. Uh, I heard at age three, you were in a church play and, a, and an agent or talent scout saw you forget your lines and you did some improv and that impressed them so much uh, to sign you. Is that true? Um, well, she wasn't a talent scout. There was a member of the congregation. Um, her son had done a couple commercials and uh, had an agent and said, you know, at three and a half years old, if he's able to not get too flustered in front of an audience, he's got some potential. So, uh, you know, she set up an appointment with an agent and I went to meet with the agent and the agent sent me on an audition that day and I got the job. So awesome. Um, in the early 60s was your first foray into uh, TV and it was for a used uh, car dealership, if I'm not mistaken. But your first national commercial was for Mattel, where you and a very uh, young uh, Pamela, Pamela Ferdin her hugged your animal yakkers, Larry the Lion and Crackers the Parrot. And as a special treat, uh, we're going to watch that first commercial right now, John. When's the last time you saw it? <laughs> oh, um, every once in a while. Oh, okay. I'm going through my, <laughs> but it's a fun one. So for the fans, let's uh, take a look at uh, the yakkers that, that you made with Pamela uh, Ferdin. Ooh, I scared myself. Larry and Crackers are Mattel's soft and wonderful new animal yakkers. Ah, crackers want a cracker? Their mouths really move when they talk. There's Larry the Lion and Crackers the Parrot with his own perch. You can get them wherever lions are sold. Oh, okay, parrots too. Okay, parrots too. So uh, you remember doing that or being on the set or is that way, way back? <coughs> There's some memory back there. 
Right. Um, yeah. Remember your first commercial back almost, you know, 60 years ago, more. Correct. Right. Anyway, let's uh, talk about in, uh, in uh, 1965, um, you got your first TV role as a young uh, Scotty Baldwin and, uh, uh, in, on General Hospital. Then in 66, you were cast uh, in your first, uh, I guess, soon to be future uncle, Bill Brian Keith, in a, in, the, uh, in a very funny Oscar-nominated comedy, The Russians Are Coming. The Russians Are Coming. Uh, do you remember being on that set with that incredible cast? Like, let me name them. Alan Arkin, Carl Reiner, Jonathan Winters, Theodore Bikel. Tell us about what you remember. Oh, I, I mean, that I do remember um, pretty well. I uh, remember that my mother was a 30-something uh, you know, housewife, but she took me uh, to um, um, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which uh, was going to be actually a small New England sh fish town or fishing village. Um, Although the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west, uh, <laughs> they had it uh, just the opposite or whatever. Um, but I remember our mom in my hotel room was next door to Brian Keith's. And so he would knock on the door and say, can Johnny Whitico come out to play? <laughs> and right. so he was missing. Uh, he had two daughters at the time uh, and uh, kind of missing them. And so he uh, went ahead and uh, just kind of started playing ball with me and uh, became friends. And then when uh, he, I suppose he went to the producers and said, um, I had this young boy on my last film and he's a good actor and i'd like him to get a uh you know some kind of a a, a continuing role on the show <clears throat> because um you know i think he would be good anyway um and the reason he didn't say the role of jody was because originally um family affair was set for a 16 year old girl which was sissy a 10-year-old boy, which would be Jody, and then the baby of the family, a six-year-old girl, who would be Buffy. And the first episode was all about her being brought to her uh, uncle's house by his sister, who was over Buffy. Another relative was watching me, and another friend watching Sissy. Um because our parents had died in a car accident and uncle bill was um <clears throat> on the front of you know time weekly or something like that and so everybody brought all of the kids to uh uncle bill's house and that's how it started but um i was the only six-year-old boy there for the um screen test and uh that screen test i met up with pamela and ferdin again because she was uh going to be uh there for the role of buffy and a couple of other young girls and then anisa and i did a little scene together and the producer said you know here is television history this is we're going to change it from a 10 year old brother to a twin brother and buffy and jody the twins were born right well that's a great story about family affair uh the lead character's last name in, in the russians were coming the russians were coming of carl reiner was whitaker was that a coincidence or what yes walt whitaker was the name of the character played by uh carl reiner but it had nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if, if, you, if you say so. 
But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Nope, no, uh, no nepotism there, right, Johnny? Right. <laughs> Anyway, in 1966 till 71, those were the years that you did uh, uh, Family Affair, and that was the iconic role, as you said, of Jody Davis uh, with Anissa Jones as Buffy, Kathy Garver as Sissy, and the great Sebastian Cabot as the gentleman uh, butler, Mr. French. Uh, the show was a huge hit, and just briefly, I'm going to bring up some of my favorite episodes, uh, Johnny, and maybe you can mention just a little tidbit uh, what you uh, remember, or just say pass uh, if you don't, okay? All right. Uh, let's see, what was my first favorite episode? Uh, oh, yeah, the episode where Jody thinks Uncle Bill doesn't love him anymore. Do you remember that one? <laughs> yes. That was kind of a sad thing. Why did you think that? Oh, he wasn't paying you a... Oh, he was, your, your punishment wasn't harsh enough. Exactly, because um, other kids were getting... Um, spanked and uncle bill never spanked us right and so uh i mean the the idea was that if he didn't spank us our friend said well that that means that he doesn't love you that's right and um so he goes ahead and gives me a whack on the bum and says if that's all it takes to let you know i love you then you know i'll do it right that, that's tv back then um anyway so another episode is where uh, Mrs. Beasley gets lost. What a nightmare that was. Right, Mr. French. Um, um, somehow Mrs. Beasley got put on the, the um, veranda of the uh, porch and uh, Uncle Bill's girlfriend, who also, in another episode, is... Uh, a teacher of ours, <laughs> but um, she pulls her purse and that sends Mrs. Beasley down. And Pamela Ferdin has a Mrs. Beasley doll, but it is not the same Mrs. Beasley doll. And uh, Uncle Bill and uh, his girlfriend find Mrs. Beasley in the trash that um and gets it gets her back right okay what about this one uh, i think you predated danny from the shining when jody had an invisible friend <laughs> yes that was um was his name lawrence something like clarence that. yeah clarence the invisible bear um when i filmed that our director, um, who was a short little man, about as tall as Anissa and I were at the time, <laughs> um, his face was right up next to the camera. You know, the cameras were here, and his face was right there watching everything that was being, um, being filmed. And... Um, Basically, what you see in the film or in, in the series episode is Jody and Mr. French and Uncle Bill are at a psychiatrist's office. And um, they go in and talk to the psychiatrist before I go in. But I sit and I start telling the story of the three bears to... Um, Clarence, the uh, the invisible bear, right? And it in the script, it just said, um, you know, Jody starts reading the three bears. Once upon a time, there were three bears. Dot dot dot, and that's all that it was in the script. Well, I've always been told that until they say cut, you continue telling the story, or you continue talking, or you're on screen. So I said, so once upon a time, there were three bears, a mama bear, a baby bear, and a daddy bear. And I just told the entire story, and they filmed the whole thing. Well, I have to watch it, that back and see that. That's hilarious. It, you know, and um, I guess they were thinking maybe they would cut back to it or something. I don't know exactly what it was, but they let it run the whole time. And when I finished, 
with Goldilocks, um, the whole set erupted in applause. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Oh, that that's a great story. Okay, this one kind of freaked me out. I'm I'm a big TV buff and stuff like that. So when characters are kind of replaced, which we'll talk about also later in Sigmund, uh, you know, when Dick York became Dick Sargent on Bewitched, it always freaked me out. Same thing happened when Mr. French's brother Nigel took over for him. What was that all about? <laughs> well, Sebastian had um, some medical problems um, with having a minor stroke or something to where he was unable to continue the second season. And so what they did is uh, rewrote the series episode to um, having the Queen requesting Mr. French to come back to England to um, help the Queen with her son or something that was being a rebel rouser. And Mr. French was the only one who she thought would be able to, you know, take care of him. And so instead of having the family without Mr. French, um, Niles French, his older or younger brother. Oh, it was Niles, not Nigel. Yeah, Niles French, Giles and Niles. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, and that was uh, John, I forget his last oh, name. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay. No, that's I didn't know that, so that's good to know why he was replaced. It's usually because of uh, a leave of absence or a medical reason, or even sometimes over, uh, over salary. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, another great episode. Uh, this one, is a, I remember, freaked me out as a kid. Kind of remember when Son of Frankenstein, when the monster pulls out Lionel Atwell's arm, when Mrs. Beasley's arm got ripped out. How traumatic was that? <laughs> right. And then we went to the doll hospital. Right. To reattach it. Exactly. Right. Another one, Eve Plum, pre-Brady Bunch, and probably one of the saddest episodes in the history of television. She discovers she's dying, and that wasn't a happy ending. The way it was written, it's like, well, goodbye. You know, wow, what's your take on that? <coughs> well, I think that the writers um, of all of the episodes, I mean, of course, they had to work immediately. Um, Family Affair was filmed three months with Brian Keith and six months without him. We were right. filming nine months out of the year. So at the beginning of the season, all 26 episodes needed to be written, or at least a major part of them, because uh, Brian was only going to be there for those three months, and any scene that Brian was in, we needed to film that within those three months. So, um, but the... Um, See, Ira, his what? Ira and his wife were the main writers, um, and they um, would look at it. And, and basically, each half-hour episode was like a um, a nice, happy story that had a purpose and a reason. Um, Family Affair was a dramedy. It wasn't a comedy um, where everything was slapstick and happy and funny and, and all that. But it was a series that took current events and children growing up with them, like Birds, Bees, and Buffy. We learned about how babies are made um, and how to tell a child under the age of 10 about where babies come from. And um, then the episode with um, uh, Eve Plum, where she had um, cancer and was going to die. Pretty heavy and for that so, time. 
and yeah, I mean, especially, and that's why it was called a dramedy. So um, that episode, um, Eve was in another, was um, even something else that is happening all the time today, Zoom classes with your teacher. But in the day then, it had to be a specific special uh, hookup where um, she was in her bedroom at home, but yet in our classroom, and uh, which the technology of the day was not such that it would be an easy task. Um, and then Jody and Buffy wanted to go meet this girl, and so we went and became friends, and um, then she dies. Right. No, one, set one of the saddest episodes, I think, in, in TV history. And so we'll leave it at that one. I mean, there was plenty of other uh, episodes. I'm just going to briefly say one of my other favorites. You don't have to mention it unless you want. Was when um, Sissy wants to become a hippie and she realizes that's not, unless you want to give your two cents on that one. Do you remember that episode? <laughs> oh, I remember that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we thought we were losing Sissy to uh, the flower power movement right she realized that she needed to to stay there's another one albertine okay the, the series um albertine was a poor black girl and uh we were able to in the <clears throat> you know this is in the 60s right when the um the blacks were uh, I guess 64 is when um, uh, President Johnson uh, signed the, uh, you know, that you could not um, discriminate for housing because of color and all of that. Um, but Albertine was a friend of ours in our classroom and uh, she was black and, but very intelligent and I don't remember exactly what it was, but I just thought as an adult today, I realized that it is, um, it was ahead of its time. Right. You, what did you help her find the housing or an apartment or? I forget exactly what it was that we did, but okay. uh, we befriended her and um, went to her house and, you know, she was a, a single mom with a, a, a single daughter uh, living in the projects. But, um, you know, I don't wow. know why uh, we were living on uh, Park Avenue and right. how close that was to the projects doesn't really sound right. But, you know, right. it was Hollywood and not uh, real television. Right. No, you guys real. tackled a lot of issues. That's what I think one of the staying powers of the of the show was. So let's move on after family. The, well, family. While you're still on Family Affair, you still did some stuff in the late '60s, early '70s. You appeared on a bunch of uh, well-known episodic TV shows. Um, let's see. I think you were on this in '67. You were on it again in uh, in '71. You did an episode of uh, of Gunsmoke. So all you see is your head there, but you're talking to James Arness. Uh, so right. you were on three episodes, 67 to, uh, and in 71. And then you were uh, in 72, uh, you did uh, an episode, I mean, in 68, uh, you were uh, on Bonanza. And uh, who's, who's your little co-star there? I forget her name right now, but she played my sister and um, Tobin is is coming to my name i okay. think her last name is tobin uh okay. but we were brother and sister almost looked like buffy and jody almost yeah <laughs> but our father was a um a horse trader and um hoss comes to our house to buy a horse or horses and um, our father is beating us up and my mom up. And he is getting drunk every night and not taking care of us. Wasn't Neville and Brand playing your dad? If that's what you say, I can't remember. I think there's a picture of him, the great Neville Brand. That's what he played was kind of bad guys. Um, okay. So, and then let me just I'll, move I'll on. Then you, you yeah, go ahead. Then you did The Virginian with Doug McClure. Right. 
And what's going on here? <laughs> um, well, there is, um, I was kind of a orphan waif. Oh, what other that waif is in. there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's cool. Uh, and then, as I said, that was with Doug McClure. Uh, so you did that, and then that same year, uh, I think is I think um, you appeared on a show where you had, I think, one of your first uh, adult crushes in Elizabeth uh, Montgomery. You were in an episode of Bewitched called yeah. uh, Sam uh, and, the and the Beanstalk. Let me see if I could get a picture of that up there, right there, where you are Jack in the Beanstalk, and uh, Tabitha is feeling bored, so she kind of zaps you into reality and takes your no, place. No, 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 no. Some, um, um, Aaron, oh. um, Tabitha, uh, this is the episode just before Adam is born. Oh, okay. And they know that it's going to be a boy. And um, so uh, Tabitha thinks that they only like boys and not girls. And so she wants to see what it's like to have a brother. And so she zaps me out of the picture book and um, brings in um, uh, brings me into life. Right. So Jack and the Beanstalk. The picture book. You're Jack. You're Jack of Jack and the Beanstalk. Right. Right. And, and then uh, Tabitha goes and meets up with the giant, while I am dressed in Jack and the Beanstalk clothing. Um, you know, 18th century stuff. Um, and uh, Darren's mother sees us, and anyway, it's it's just it's lots of fun. But I remember um, coming on to the set. I think my call was like ten o'clock, um, and probably was sometime during the summer because I don't remember having school that day but anyway i just remember being off the set looking onto the set and seeing elizabeth montgomery and my heart just dropping right that is elizabeth montgomery oh right now i heard you saying you were team uh, montgomery over team eden barbara eden yeah. i'll take both any day but anyway, uh, let's move on to the next. Um, in oh, you forgot Green Acres. I did two episodes. Oh, no, I'm coming up on that. We're oh, going okay. in chronological, Johnny. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> in 69, you starred as the title character in a Hallmark Christmas special based on the 1946 Charles Tazewell book, The Littlest Angel, with Fred Gwynn from uh, The Monsters and Tony Randall from The Odd Couple, the great dancer Cab, Call Cab Calloway, the beautiful Connie Stevens, and of course, E.G. Marshall is God. Who else would he play, right? Um, <laughs> it was shot on video and utilized a lot of trippy green screen to depict, to depict heaven. Uh, it was kind of like a croft show, if you think about it, before they even started their run. I'm going to put up a photo there with you and, and uh, Fred Gwynn. What do you remember about this trippy shot-to-video movie? Well, what I do remember is a 90-minute special right it's supposed to take um usually they call them 18 day miracles um where you usually uh work you know 5 10 15 you know days uh with saturday and sunday off and then um you know, three extra days for pickups or whatever. And I remember we flew to New York, my mother and I, and got into our hotel room. And the next day we were um, waiting for the teacher uh, to come. And in California, it is required to have a teacher um, from the 1930s to the present for any child working in entertainment. New York's child labor laws did not require it. And since we were working in New York, the producers did not 
see well usually what i would do is have a teacher come along with me but they wanted to get a teacher from new york so i would do a couple of hours not the full three hours a day that was required um and then we would go over to um 42nd street where we had the um the where we would rehearse in the rehearsal hall and then also we went to the foy theater where uh the foy brothers had created the the flying stuff for the flying scene with connie stevens right and um then so for about 15 days we just rehearsed and then in um 72 hours we completed the filming or the taping of the film which usually you know like i said takes a 17 day miracle we did that in three days um first day i worked from 8 a.m till 2 a.m and the second day i worked from 10 a.m to 4 a.m and the third day i worked from 10 a.m until we got it finished wow and i remember connie stevens was pregnant with um her youngest daughter i believe and she was flying and it was like two in the morning doing this scene and as she were was flying she, as soon as she would come off the um the wires the scaffolding the wiring she would throw up into a bucket right and um again at two o'clock in the morning i'm a nine-year-old boy trying to deal with adult issues and <laughs> trying to smile and be the littlest angel anyway um my mother came and said no we you know i'm taking johnny home and she needs to go and rest she's pregnant i've have at the time mom had uh eight children i know what it's like and she does not deserve to be here and you know my mom was about ready to cut the show and the producers came and the director came uh joe layton was the uh director and said please we just need one more try and um connie said well if johnny can do it i can do it mm. and i said well if connie can do it i can do it and we went ahead and finished the scene and you know got right. it done now that, that's a fantastic story i love the inner stories of stuff like that I, you're right the labor laws were different in california you never get away with that a strict eight hour day or whatever maybe 10 hours with breaks but that, that's crazy uh, here we see a picture of uh, E.G. Marshall as God. You're having a little conversation. Let me give you my take on this. When I saw it as a kid, I remember thinking it was so sad. You play Michael, a shepherd, little shepherd, who inexplicably goes to heaven and doesn't show you die, I don't think. And you're like, why am I here? I want to go back to Earth. Uh, great family entertainment with a side story later about the birth of Jesus. Uh, it's actually, as, a sad, as I said, a very sad story. Another thing I remember, uh, Johnny, is... During that flying scene, which is the highlight, I think, of, of, the, uh, of the entire thing, because you have background angels jumping up and down on trampolines, um, and Connie just singing her guts out. I had no idea she was pregnant. You know, I want to fly, and she's teaching you how to fly. What was funny is you keep trying to keep your shepherd's hat on. I'm watching it because it keeps trying to fall off. So maybe they didn't edit that out or cut that out, but at least three different scenes, you're holding, <laughs> you're holding your little angelic hat on so it wouldn't fall out during the I Want to Fly number. 
<laughs> but uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, you were on Green Acres. Of course, you were 1971. Um, two episodes. Two episodes with Eddie Albert and Ava Gabor. Uh, and, and in Ava all these. Ava asked my mother if she could adopt me. Oh, darling, can I adopt your boy? Um, I used to said, call. I you used to already have. You already have seven other children. I just want one. Right. You could. You could. Yeah. It's a funny one. I used to always confuse Ava and Zsa Zsa. Who didn't? Right. Anyway, you were on, on a slew of top ten rated shows. Something that uh, a lot of people aren't aren't on. Does that does that dawn on you when you're a kid that you're on another hit show or you're just going on another job? You know, I. I I did not know how lucky or how prolific uh, I was at the time. Um, behind me in that photo uh, is a good friend of mine, uh, Randy Whipple, who we always kind of went up against each other for roles, and he's still a friend of mine today. Um, but um, I just did what they told me to do, you know, went on an audition, did this scene. And a lot of times I didn't have to audition, uh, but, uh, you know, did. You're Johnny Whitaker. Why would you have to audition? Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, right after that, uh, you were on another top 10, very popular show, Marcus, uh, Welby MD. Uh, was there really no time in between or you were just be calling with a snap? I mean, basically one gig would end and another would, would start. I guess so. And along with that, I, um, with family affair in our second season, we went five seasons and in season two, um, elder manufacturing company created the Jody line of clothing. Anissa Jones had the Cinderella Buffy line of clothing and um, Elder Manufacturing went to the producers and then went to my agent and uh, created the Jody line of clothing. And so when I was not filming, I was out on the road uh, doing uh, shows. Um, Promoting your clothing line, show. yeah. Um, going from city to city, um, touting my my clothing line, and the Jody, uh, uh, the Johnny Winnaker collection. Well, it was the Jody. It was Tom Sawyer selected specifically for Jody. Then, in 1971, when Family Affair went off the air, they got a little bit nervous. And so they brought in Brandon Cruz. So it was the Johnny Whitaker or the Brandon Cruz line chosen by Johnny Whitaker. To succeed you. Yes. And then Courtship of Eddie's Father was canceled. And I continued to do some Disney films. And so they continued it back to the Johnny Whitaker line of clothing. And then uh, I did the movie Tom Sawyer, of course, and we'll get into that. But right. with um, the clothing line, then it was like Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer is wearing our Tom Sawyer clothing. And so it was Johnny Whitaker, Tom Sawyer clothing, which went through. Um, but every summer, I did at least three to four weeks of, uh, well, it was a spring and a fall line. So I had a winter and um, spring uh, going on tour. Well, you learned some. I mean, I didn't know that. That's fantastic. The different clothing lines, depending on what movie you were in. And you went back and forth with Brandon Cruz. Let's just continue on. You did other TV shows. Uh, you were on Adam 12 and, and Mobile One. Here's a shot of you. Uh, I don't know, were you on a moped or a motorcycle? I was on a motorcycle, and it was actually... Um, Is that Beverly Hills? Uh, looks like Cannon kind of or like Beverly it. Drive. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, what is uh, the guy on the left? What's his name? Uh, Martin Milner. Martin Milner's son was uh, my uh, 
the rider of the motorcycle. Oh, okay. Do you remember that? Did you have fun riding that around? Yeah. Um, I was not a big motorcycle or, you know, person. Right. Um, and later on, probably when I was about 16, um, my agent sent me out on an audition, but I had to ride a motorcycle. And I thought, I don't know how to ride a motorcycle. But as a as an actor, an actor does. And right. so you lie and you say, of course I ride a motorcycle. So I went out to a girlfriend of mine. Okay, she has a motorbike. She had like a Honda 50. Um, and uh, she told me how to ride it and um oh, hold on just a second so um you know i was on like a honda 90 i think it was right and she taught me how to ride it and two up and three down or whatever it was and they you know i went on the interview and they said well we just want you to come back for a um uh, another interview just to make sure that you know how to ride a motorcycle. And that's when I went with my girlfriend and learned how to, to, you know, ride this Honda 90. So I get to the second audition and it is a Harley Davidson. <laughs> I mean, a great, it wasn't a Harley Davidson, but it was a big, big bike. And I just said, well, you know, is this young kid going to be able to afford a big bike? He said, well, this is the only one we could find for you to try. So I said, okay, is it three up and two down? What is it on this one? I've, I've not ridden one before. And they told me what it was. And so, okay. So I got on the bike and, you know, rode around the, the parking lot, did a popped a wheelie accidentally. <laughs> And, you know, got the role. Right. No, I remember that episode, actually. So, in, uh, you're also, also as I mentioned, you were in a, quite a few movies in the, in the early 70s, uh, such as uh, Disney's remake of the, the Biscuit Eater, where you befriend a feral bird dog. I don't know what a feral bird dog is. Maybe you could tell me. It also starred Earl Holloman and, and Godfrey Cambridge. What do you remember about the, the Biscuit Eater? Oh, I remember that well. And George Spell was my best friend, who was a uh, crop sharing uh, single mom best friend. And again, this was in the early 70s and uh, kind of putting a black boy and a white boy together was not as common, but we were best friends and that was no problem for me. But um, it, um, moreover was the name of the, um, the dog because um, George Spell's mother, who was um, played by B. Anyway, she was also in The Man Who Comes to Dinner. She played uh, the mother to... Um, uh, Anyway, forgot, uh, but B was her first name. And I think she w got an Academy nomination for her role in um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Okay. But uh, anyway, she played the, the mom of George, and um, she read out of the book of the Bible. That's where she got her name because text was the name of George Spell. Um, because of the text of the Bible. Mm. And we said, moreover, I said, moreover, that's a great name. Anyway, but he was not a feral dog. A feral would mean that he was a um, uh, kind of nobody. I guess it, it's true. Nobody wanted him because he was an egg sucker. Oh, and, <laughs> okay. But uh, George Spell and I, or text Tomlin and myself, um, brought him up to be a good a good uh bird dog right i think i saw it once when it aired so my memory's a little bit uh vague uh this was followed up 
1972 with another Disney movie, which you're no, obviously also well known for. And it's also, even though it's a family movie, it's kind of got a little cult following. Napoleon and and Samantha with uh, Will Gear, where you try to where you try to run away with an old lion with your friend uh, Jody Foster, and you try to get Michael Douglas to help you out. And in uh, one scene, you almost fall off a cliff, but Major the Lion uh, saves you. It was a very touching, feel-good family movie. So tell us about this film. Well, that summer, we were, um, when, you know, young kids from California go to do a Disney film, um, during the summer, we did not have to have school. However... Brandy Foster, Jody's mother, insisted that we have a teacher. Well, they had to have a welfare worker or a teacher on the set. And the teacher um, had to be fluent in French because Jody was going into Le Lycée Francais that next semester, which was a private French speaking only school. And so that summer, um, Mrs. Jean Seaman, who was our um, teacher and welfare worker, taught us French. And so Jody and I would go around the set saying, C'est une voiture, répétez. That is a car, repeat. <laughs> right. And, you know, just making jokes and learning French. Wow. And then let's take a look at uh, Will Gear. What do you remember about him? Well, um, now, Will Gear turned out to be the grandpa in the Waltons. Right. And he was my grandpa, and uh, I was kind of orphaned and living with him. And then Jodie Foster was living with Gertrude, who was her caretaker, who happens to be Grandma Walton. And so the two Ellen of Corbin. them... Uh, yes, Ellen Corby. And uh, the two of them were in the film. They didn't have any scenes together, but um, they became Grandma and Grandpa Walton. Right. No, I remember watching that. It's a fun, very fun movie. I think I went to the theater on Fairfax and Beverly, where they showed uh, a lot of family fair Disney movies. So the next film you were in was kind of a change of pace. It's, it was actually, a, I guess, a challenge to your wholesome... Um, well, it wasn't raunchy or anything, but it was more of a psychological uh, horror film. And it was Steven Spielberg's uh, second uh, made-for-TV movie after he made the successfully uh, critically acclaimed Duel. And uh, that was something evil. And uh, it was with Darren McGavin as your dad and Sandy Dennis as your mom. And you move into a, a new home that, that may be haunted. And this was real spooky. It was like a, a thinking man's horror film, not your usual, you know, with, with gore and bloods and, and, and guts and stuff. And you end up going through some weird psychological change as well. You, you kind of crawling on the floor after a, a, after a frog, kind of a change of pace for you, huh, Johnny? Well, what happened is it was a pre-exorcist exorcist film. Mm -hmm. And um, I, of course, had been playing sweet little Jody, and uh, I guess that was... Um, I mean, Steven look at that Spielberg. look. I mean, look at that. There's something hidden there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steven Spielberg wanted Jody because Jody turns into the devil at the end of the film. Oh, you, oh spoiler alert. He Well, he, he doesn't turn into, but he gets possessed right. at the end of the film. But... Um, Everything is beautiful, and um, love overcomes all evil. And uh, but that was a, a really interesting. We filmed that all on the Disney Ranch here in uh, Santa Clarita, and I was given an honorable mention Emmy nod. Wow! Um, for my portrayal, and. Uh, what happens, I guess there's like three um, levels that you have to go through. And the first, you know, the producer and director nominate you. And um, because I was 
uh, you know, it was for best supporting actor in a uh, mini series or or uh, the eighteen day miracle, the ninety minute um, movie of the week special. Right. Um, and since I was a child, I suppose I was not given that opportunity to go to the final balloting where your name is, you know, it's you and four other people. So, um, but I made it to the third balloting. And so I got an honorable mention, uh, by the Academy. Well, that's cool. But, um, you know, it, uh, you know, growing up and being, um, especially at that time, a very faithful Mormon boy, uh, we were trying to decide if, you know, I should go into the occult and if it would be okay. But, you know, as we looked at the script and, and read it and talked to our bishop and, you know, the, the whole idea was that good triumphs over evil and love will triumph over Satan. And uh, so, you know, it was a good, but I had to say, be damned. <laughs> That's right. It's almost like you were Rosemary's uh, baby, but, you know, a few years later, look what happened to Rosemary's baby. Right. But, but uh, no, I remember it. It scared me as a kid. Uh, there was a bunch of scary TV movies uh, back in those days, and that was one of them. So the next film you did in 73, I think, was a turning point in your career, Johnny, you went from, I think, child star to teen star. And that was with the musical Tom, the musical uh, movie Tom Sawyer, uh, produced by Reader's Digest. And, um, and also producer <clears throat> Arthur Jacobs, who was famous for all the Planet of the Apes movies. So kind of a weird thing for him to be doing. But nonetheless, uh, the movie uh, also featured your, your co-star again, Jodie Foster as Becky Thatcher. Uh, Jeff East is Huck Finn, uh, Warren Oates, and Dub Taylor. Now, this was, this was a big production. And, and show, Celeste Holm right? played Aunt Polly. And who played Injun Joe? Well, um, in the uh, credits, his name is Kunu Hank. K-U-N-U, uh, and then Hank. But his real name was... Um, Henry McGreevy or something like that. Okay. And they just said, that's not an Indian name. We want to, um, and unfortunately, uh, Hank or Henry was drunk the whole time. Well, that's, that's what I read. So it, it, this movie actually showcased you that you could act and sing, and it was, it was very popular uh, when it came out. Tell us a little about uh, the making of it. Well, um, the summer of 1972, my family picked up stakes and we all, as a family, moved to central Missouri where um, we rented a uh, three-bedroom condo and uh, had all, well, we had seven children at the time. My oldest brother decided to stay working at the local McDonald's. Um, but the rest of my five sisters and one brother and my mom and dad, we all lived in this three bedroom condo and I had to sleep in the bed with my brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I was the star of this movie. And then we were right next to the Ramada where all of the other families and whatever would stay. But, following the lead of my father and mother some of the other um cast and crew brought their family so it was a real family affair when we filmed and um we were working the whole summer and just had a really good time how many people get to say they sang with warren oates hey i did right um and okay so this is the film uh, I finally am getting that right, where um, you gave Jodie Foster her first kiss, and there it is. There you go. Well, actually, this photo is not the photo from the film. Right. This photo was... A publicity um, shot, right? 
Well, no, it was done at the um, screen test. Wow. If you look in the back, you've got some ferns that are not native to uh, Mississippi uh, in the 1800s, California, <laughs> but not to uh, Missouri. Oh, Missouri. Okay. And so that's uh, when we did that. Um, you know, they put her in a, uh, you know, 19 or 1840s uh, dress and me in a, a shirt. But that photo is not from the film. It's from the, uh, I can see. Yeah the uh screen test you guys are puckering up and this is the shot i think when it, you guys witness injun joe uh killing um in the where they're fighting in the grave in that open grave what that was with jeff east or huckleberry finn this is when i take jody into the cave to get some the best drinking water in missouri oh, that's right and injun joe is hiding out in the cave and this is when we find that Injun Joe is coming after us. And uh, he, we think that it's, we hear Jody's father or uh, Becky's father calling us. And um, we look up and there is Injun Joe. I'm gonna kill you, Tom Sawyer. Right. If it's the last thing I do, I'm gonna kill you. Right, and it looks actually looks like it's a scene from something evil. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the scene also where Joe in the courtroom throws that uh, knife, right? That uh, Bowie knife that almost uh, hits you. Right. Right. And then he right leaps out my ear. Right, and he leaps out the window, and then there's where the search for him starts. Okay, so now uh, comes the phase. Of your well, or not the phase, but we're going back a little bit, as as you mentioned earlier. But that's fine because I wanted to give uh, Mystery in Dracula's Castle its own private props because that is one of the, my favorite films <laughs> of all time. When I saw it as a kid, let me tell you, Johnny, why I related to it so much. Uh, not only was it a wholesome family movie, but let's just first say it was broadcast in two parts during the wonderful world of Disney. And it was about two brothers, you and S Scott Colden, who love old horror movies. And you make your own Super 8 Dracula movie in a lighthouse where a bunch of diamond thieves have set up shop. One of them is actually my old friend, Clue Gulliger. Um, the reason I love this movie so much, Johnny, is you guys are teenage Super 8 filmmakers, as I was when I was 13 or 14. And I also made little horror films uh, around with my friends. And in your bedroom, you had classic monsters up on the wall. And I was like, wow, that's like my bedroom. So this movie, as I said, just has a special place uh, in my heart. Was it, as fun, uh, was it as fun to make as it is to watch? Oh, yeah. We had a great time doing that. And um, we filmed it at Zuma Beach, Zuma Doom. And um, the we the the castle or the um, uh, search not a searchlight the lighthouse the, uh, lighthouse was all chroma keyed in at the top of Zuma Doom, and what nobody knew was that on one side of zuma doom is you know zuma and doom beach on the other side is a cove which was a nude beach <laughs> and of course a lot of the um daffers and lighting people when we were up on the lookout were looking down over and seeing the nude beach and then scott and i get up there and uh we decide to you know look over it oh no 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 the kids can't see this the kids can't <laughs> right and there's there's scott as, as count there's dracula yeah. i would kill to have that super eight footage is there any possible way of finding it <laughs> i i don't believe there was any film in the camera okay because and you you slowed it down to i think either i think 18 or 12 frames per second and so the cape is flowing in the air and you you got all this great music and stuff it's just 
Do, do people, uh, besides, you know, The Family Affair and uh, Sigmund, do they do people come up to you and mention this film as, as, as touching them, or is it just me? Am I certain, nuts? <laughs> certainly do, yeah. And, and they also had a scholastic book that came out um, because it was popular, and um, the, they had it for um, learning about filmmaking or learning about stories and all. Right. Okay. So uh, now let's get to, um, I guess, the piece de resistance and our special tribute. And that is to uh, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, uh, a classic Saturday morning kid show, along with the other great Croft Brothers shows like Puff and Stuff and Lidsville and Land of the Lost. So were you offered the lead role of, of Johnny Do? to the success of Tom Sawyer, or did they also see you in Dracula's Castle, or was it a little bit of both? I think it was, you know, I was the it boy of 1973. So um, Donny Osmond and I had a fight over who was the best kisser. <laughs> Donny won. I do not know. I don't remember having kissed many girls or knowing that I was necessary or whatever right so uh he's always been my nemesis um but uh the crofts came to my agent and um offered me the starring role starring johnny whitaker and they wanted me to do uh have an album that they would uh produce with chelsea records well i was going to talk to you about that too and um you know f for my musical talents and they weren't going to pay me what my agent wanted and so my agent said well then i want you to give him five percent of the show so i became an actual producer on the show and got to choose my co-star scott colden right i'm gonna get get to that so you and and uh, your co-star scott colden had some great on on screen chemistry that just flowed naturally uh I, you can see it was it was evident in uh in dracula's castle so when it was time to cast scott i know you you had a little say to to suggest scott did the croft brothers see him in dracula's castle to see the chemistry that you guys had i don't know i just remember being with sid and marty in their office and five or ten boys who were going to be my brother came in and I would um, interact with them and talk with them and then do a scene together. And um, when Scott came in the room, I just remember, hey, Scott! And, you know, we high-fived and gave each other a hug. I knew some of the other boys, too, um, but I'd not worked with the other boys. And so Scott and I did the scene and... Um, when S Scott left and there might have been one or two other boys, I just said, you know, for me, it's Scott. And um, I don't remember what the name of the character was, but I said I would not do the show unless I could use my own name, Johnny, because I was sick and tired of people calling me Jody, Jody, Jody. Right. <laughs> and so... I wanted it to be my real name. And so they did Johnny and Scott, our brothers, but we're friends. Right. Um, finest of friends that ever could be on the land or on the sea. <laughs> anyway, so um, that's, uh, that's how, you know, how I remember it anyway. Okay. Well, going over the show, uh, for those who are living on another planet, the plot centered on two brothers named Johnny and Scott Stewart. While playing on the beach near Dead Man's Point, the two of you guys discover a friendly sea monster named Sigmund, who had been thrown out of uh, his cave by his dysfunctional sea monster family for refusing to frighten people. Uh, the boys hide Sigmund in their clubhouse as Sigmund's older brothers blurp and slurp uh, promise to bring him home. So, uh, but to put it in more simple, simplistic terms, John, would you say the basic premise uh, for every episode was for Johnny and Scott to not let 
any other human being, but especially not their housekeeper, Zelda, find out that they're secretly keeping a sea monster as a roommate? <laughs> exactly. I mean, <laughs> they've got homework and they've got, to, they've got to sweep and they've got to clean their room, but under no circumstances is anyone supposed to find out about Sigmund. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What would be the I worst mean, thing if people found out about Sigmund? Well, it would answer all of the questions back to uh, the Loch Ness because we there is a, an, an episode in which they talk about Nessie, um, which is a, like a relative or something. And, <laughs> and um, you know, I um, the whole idea is we're trying to hide something from our childhood. And um, if we ever found out that he didn't exist, you know, our childhood would have been blown up. But uh, he did exist. And Sigmund was my friend. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, here's something else, Johnny, you can clear up. Don't know if you've ever been asked this question. And this is a big Sigmund mystery that I've been waiting to ask you for decades. Okay. During the entire two season run, Three your parent, seasons. yes, your parents, you know, the ones who live in the main house who are never seen, did the Crofts think that the audience watching at home wouldn't pick up on that? It's like, where are your parents, Johnny? Now, I think you mentioned them on occasion, but why not at least have them appear uh, once in a while? Because it's not very common. That two 14 year old kids live all alone in a clubhouse with their middle aged housekeeper who has the whole main house to herself. It's just an observation, Johnny. Well, actually, our bedroom was on the, was, was on the bottom floor. Okay. Uh, right behind the kitchen. And I don't know where uh, Zelda's bedroom was, but. Um, where are your parents, Johnny? I have no idea. They're on a permanent vacation. Well, what happened is the cross didn't want to pay two more adults. <laughs> but it's so odd. You know what I mean? It's just like these two. No, but no, listen, it's such a fun show. And you, you guys make it fun that you don't really. I'm just kidding around. Obviously, I'm not thinking every second where are their parents. But when is, you know, 30, 40 years later, when you're doing a podcast and you've got the lead actor with you, you want to know where the heck the parents are. <laughs> yeah. Um, for some reason, they were, you know, international spies. I don't know. Um, but um, then in uh, after the second season, near the end of it, um, Mary Wicks left and we got another... Um, right, I was gonna. We'll, we'll talk about yeah, yeah. We'll talk. About, that's uh, Fran Ryan. Exactly. We'll talk about her, who's also. I think she was famous for playing like uh, a um, like a cleanser lady or something like that. Yeah, and busybody. Right. Well, right. Who was always very snotty and angry. But anyway, were all the exterior shots at the beach and the cave done in Malibu or Marina del Rey? Old Sigmund, um, or Sigmund Classic was all filmed at Point Doom Zuma. And then the uh, then all the interior scenes, the beach house, your home, the oozes, uh, clam house interior was shot at the lot on Formosa, correct? Well, that was the first season. Right before the fire. Right before the fire on the second season where um, a big gobo, which is one of the big lights, had fallen and the bulb landed on top of one of the uh, walls oh wow well oh, is that this is that it that is that's from the outside wow. hmm i anyway, found this in a newspaper ad that talked about it wow cool um but what had happened is the styrofoam was supposed to be flame resistant or retardant but once it got lit, then that's all they said. And it, uh, the whole, and of course, behind the, uh, you know, it, it was um, all wood behind it, and then paper mache kind of over top of it, and then 
sprayed with um, the um, supposedly non-flame resistant um, foam, and that foam then was what looked like rocks, but it was right. uh, styrofoam and uh, very flammable. And um, Rip Taylor was there because it was season two. And um, you, you were about to, that was the, during the first episode of season two. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, you know, I remember reading about that years ago, and I always thought, and I read it, it was destroyed nearly all the sets, costumes, props, so much, in fact, that the Croft brothers decided you guys would go experimental with very minimal sets. So was this incident a total shock to everybody involved? And did you, how long before you kind of recovered and settled back to, to filming again? I think we did a two or three month hiatus and then came back at General Services Studio, which is also where we did uh, Green Acres um, at the Screen Gems um, set. And uh, that's when uh, Land of the Lost came in and they were the, uh, they used some of the Sigmund sets as their caves as well. Oh, okay. Now let's, um, for season, here's another, I'm full of questions, uh, Johnny, that I hopefully you haven't been asked before. Uh, for season one, the intro song that you sang at the beginning of the show was, you gotta have friends, 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 right. Big hit for you. And then for season two, it was changed to Sigmund, the sea monsters, and Johnny and Scott are friends with a closing theme that closely resembles faintly uh, a Beatles tune, Got to Get You Into My Life. You better run, you better hide, as opposed to, took a, you know, I was alone, I took a ride. Okay, first, <laughs> why the change in the opening, if it was such a successful hit, the Friends song, why change it? And number two, what's with the Beatle melody for the closing theme? <laughs> well, um, happy coincidence. Jimmy Haskell was one of the music producers. Um, so you got to ask him. Okay, but you never noticed that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, we, uh, what happened is because the Friends album did okay, but it did, you know, wasn't in the top hundred of uh, uh, music, uh, Sid Croft said, we must have the story being told like all of the other Croft shows instead of this non-storytelling song. And so the second and third season, it was, let me tell you a tale, a very scary tale about two boys who were surfing one day. And, uh, you know, now Sigmund, the sea monster, and, and Johnny, Johnny and Scott, Scott our friends. friends. Finest of friends that ever could be on the land or on the sea. Right, I love that. So it's just basically just wanted to make it more detailed so they tell the story of the show in the lyrics, I guess. Yes, that okay. was the whole point. Okay, sounds good. Okay, now let's um, go over the cast of characters, pay them a little bit of homage. Uh, that made the show, the, the show so fun and successful. And perhaps you can give us a little tidbit or two uh, about them. Now, we know about the great chemistry uh, that uh, you had uh, with Scott. I'm going to put up a picture of Scott with Billy Barty, who was under uh, uh, Sigmund's uh, costume. And, uh, of course, you guys had great chemistry. So let's jump uh, right to... Uh, Zelda, uh, your housekeeper, played by the great Mary Wicks. Um, she was, a, I've seen you say, she was the master of the double take. Tell us about Mary. Mary Wicks was a wonderful, beautiful, fun-loving person to have on set. She always made us laugh and kept things light and um, friendly. She came to both Scott and my wedding receptions um, and um, was 
just a deer. She taught me how to do a double take. Um, when I did the movie Tom Sawyer, when um, I'm coming down with Aunt Polly just before the uh, whitewashing scene, um, I'm telling the story about the widow Douglas uh, falling down and having her leg uh, in a cast. And as I come down the stairs, there's the widow Douglas, healthy and up and walking. So I get caught in my lie and I have to look over and do a double take. And I didn't do it the way that the director wanted me to. So we did it about a hundred times that, you know, double take. <laughs> and so um, I was mentioning that and um, Mary said, oh, double takes are easy. And so she taught me how to do a double take. Well, like the one you just showed us, right? Exactly. Right. And then let's talk about uh, Fran Ryan, who played the, the second uh, housekeeper who replaced Mary Wicks during uh, season two after Zelda was scared off. Now, what was the real reason Mary uh, took time off? I have no idea. Um, you know, contract disputes. Um, the Crofts are wonderful people, but very well known for not paying. Yes, I, <laughs> I, 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 sometimes I've read that. And then there's, of course, Chuck Bevins, who played Sheriff Higgins. Right. And... Um, it well, just, it's Joe Higgins. Yeah. Played by um, playing the role of Sheriff Chuck Bevins. Oh my God. Are you kidding? So it's yeah. not Chuck Bevins playing Sheriff Higgins. <laughs> I got that it's one wrong. Joe Higgins playing Chuck Bevins. Right. Okay. And then uh, next, of course, let me see if I can find her. It was the great, great, great uh, lady from. Um, the Wizard of the Oz, Wizard who of played Oz. the Wicked w w Witch, and that's Margaret Hamilton. Margaret Hamilton, who played the nosy neighbor next door. Yes, she was Mrs. Eldels. Nice name, E-L-D-E-L-S, like e Eldels was it's her something. name. Maybe? And, okay. Uh, you know, getting to meet her, she was a very sweet woman. And, of course, I was, um, my favorite movie of all time is The Wizard of Oz. Okay. So getting to work with her was uh, just a, a super thing for me. Right. And she's like kind of like Mrs. Kravitz from Bewitched, the nosy uh, neighbor. Right. Okay, let's now for uh, season two, uh, of course, the great comedian Rip Taylor uh, jo joined the cast as uh, Sheldon, the bubbling genie. Now, I, I Hello. love Rip Right, right. Uh, Hello. I, <laughs> I loved Rip's humor, but why do you think he was added to the show instead of letting you and Scott continue to hide Sigmund alone? Um, I guess the uh, writers wanted to bring in magic because all of their other shows had some kind of magic in it. And, okay. Uh, Maybe right. somebody owed, owed Rip something. I don't know. <laughs> okay. And then, of course, where, where would we be where if we didn't mention uh, Sparky Marcus, who played Sheldon's genie nephew, another season two edition. Some funny lines here and there. And, of course, if you didn't know why they brought Rip in, I guess you wouldn't know why they brought in Sparky. Because <laughs> I actually, as a fan of these shows uh what it is is johnny you get so used to who the main cast are you know you you feel an attachment to them so it's, there's always like a little trepidation when they bring in uh new characters but i mean we're we're just kids so we, we just go with the flow but you just reflect later as an adult it's like why did they bring in that character i'd be remiss if i didn't mention um the, the people who played the sea monsters of course there was billy barty and van snowden and the great Sharon Baird, and Bill Germain, uh, Larry Larson, Fred Spencer, uh, and Paul Gale uh, inside the costumes. But of course, since I've done, you've done voice acting, I've done voice acting, the great Walter Edmiston, uh, who played Enoch in, in Land of the Lost, he was incredible. Not only did he voice Sigmund, he did Big Daddy and Blurp and Slurp. Anyway, B Big Mama! is yes. here get out of here sigmund exactly. um 
I was going to pay. I was going to try to see if I could pay homage because I tried to practice um, a couple uh, voices. Oh no! Here comes blurp and slurp, Johnny. So there's my uh, there's my segment. I apologize. Uh, That's pretty good. If it wasn't that good, and then of course, uh, hey, where's Sigmund? There's big there's Big Daddy, of course, and you I see, uh, Big Daddy uh, was a mock of. Um, E.G. Archie Robinson. Bunker. No? Archie Bunker. Oh, Archie Bunker. Okay. And Sweet Mama was Maud. Oh, I thought she was Phyllis Diller. Well, Phyllis Diller slash Maud. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you look at her nose and you know that it's Maud. Oh, my God. Okay. Exactly. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to try my, my best. Let's see if I can do... Um, I always confuse Blurp and Slurp, but... Uh, well, Slurp, Slurp had the Southern Oh, Slurp. Uh -oh. Well, golly, Big Daddy. Right, that's Slurp. And hey, Sigmund, get out of here. Yeah, that... Sigmund, Blurp, Blurp had more of the Hey, down, what are you doing? Voice. Right. And, and because he had the two teeth coming out of the side of his mouth. Right, I told you I would, I would destroy those voices. But, uh... but, Slurp, but Slurp had a Southern accent, and I don't know why. Slurp had a southern accent when nobody else had a southern accent. Segment, you're going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that totally. Okay, now here's one of the favorite segments that I've been waiting for the show. Uh, uh, well, before I do that, when I had Butch Patrick on the podcast a little while ago, he said that most, the most difficult thing about working on Lidsville, and I assume uh, this was a problem perhaps on all the other Croft shows that involved... Uh, real actors and the little people uh, dressed inside was the timing of the dialogue between the humans and the costume characters and hearing the lines being spoken since a lot of the costume characters uh, dialogue was added in post uh, did you find it difficult maybe talking to Sigmund or Blurp and Slurp when we did Sigmund they had um, Walker and um on the set, doing the lines. On the set, doing the lines. Yeah. No, it makes sense to have them. I mean, why, I mean, it's 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 low budget and cheap, but so what? It works. Have them stand on the side, and and say what the so it's easier as opposed to talking to nothing. Yeah. And and during rehearsal, they would be right on the set. Oh, okay. So you know they would because they wanted to kind of see what the action was. Um, they would have a, a screen in front of them. Um, that they could see and uh, the character actors inside of the costumes had to know the lines so that they could move the mouth however they needed to. Right. Uh, I, li I like I, I like that uh, different kind of sign language that you're doing there. That's kind of cool. <laughs> here, here comes Sigmund well, that, and Blurp. That's exactly how they did it because um, Slurp, his mouth opened and then Blurp's mouth opened differently, and then Sigmund only had the bottom lip talk. Oh, okay. It's very interesting to learn the inside makings of that show. So now we're going to do what I've been waiting to do. Uh, I'm going to tell you my favorite all-time uh, Sigmund and the Sea Monster episodes. And then if you can chime in um, with a memory or two, Johnny, that would be great. Okay. Very first episode is the... Uh, one of my favorites, and that is um, uh, the monster who came to dinner. And I love the scene that's in the opening credits uh, where uh, you're trying to take, uh, put Sigmund on a surfboard and take him across the street. A car honks. You guys kind of get scared. <laughs> you drop Sigmund on the ground. You scoop him up and get him back to the clubhouse. So what do you, what do you remember about that first episode? Well, actually... There is nobody in the Sigmund costume there because uh, Billy, although he was a little person, he was pretty solid. And You weren't going to drop not, Billy Barty on the ground. <laughs> right. And so um, we dropped the costume on the ground and then with the magic of television, Sigmund, or with Billy Barty, runs off. And then we got to try to find Sigmund uh, and that's when we find Sigmund and bring him back to the to the clubhouse. Okay. 
Now here comes my favorite all-time episode, Johnny. I'm sure people have told you it's because of my love of horror films. It is no surprise that Frankenstein, Frankenstein drops in, hearkening back to my love of old horror films. Scott is kidnapped by the oozes and made into a slave or a housekeeper when you dress up as Frankenstein because you find out they're a big fan of his and you walk on stilts and you attempt to rescue him and all the oozes are scared to death of you until you fall off the stilts. But you do a great impression of Boris Karloff, by the way. I think I do. Tell us about that episode. Um, well, um, our makeup um, director was Mike Weston or, or uh, Michael um, anyway the big family of um, oh come on John makeup artists um, yeah um, yeah um, anyway and, and look look at that head it's just like the real Karloff oh, one yeah almost. it was it was perfect and I had to uh, they had to make it look like I could have done it myself, so it couldn't be too good. Perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and and he, you know, these kids have their uh, uh, Frankenstein costume right available to them. I don't know. Right, but and then an and then okay. Fun. Now here comes um, my second uh, favorite episode. Of course, is there a doctor in the cave? Uh, the oozes kidnap you this time. And who makes an appearance but the Wolfman? I, I, we watched all your movies. <laughs> now, was this kind of the same, would you say, came, same kind of episode, like a follow-up to the uh, other one? I suppose so, because um, the oozes were not just um, sea monsters. They were actual monsters. Oh, okay. We put them in the same category as... You know, creature from the, the Black Lagoon. Movies. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next, next favorite episode is Make Room uh, for Big Daddy. For Big Daddy. And that's where Blurp and Slurp uh, destroy the Shellavision. Great take on a television. So they run away to move into the clubhouse. How weird! With Sigmund, when Big Daddy chases them home, but he decides to stay and watch TV in the clubhouse because he likes what's on TV. <laughs> it's just a fun great episode look at that old tv what is that is that a portable television oh it was a black and white something or other yeah okay that's the back of it right it was the back of it okay next favorite episode of course and it's so cool it's like what if what would be the only day of the year that sigmund would not be recognized or people wouldn't scream of course that would be halloween so in the episode trick or treat see I, you know, he goes out trick or treating, and everyone thinks it's a great costume, even Zelda. <laughs> so, and he yeah. learns how to trick, and he turns over all of the uh, um, trash cans, and the police are after him. Oh, okay. Because he learns how to do a trick if you don't give him a treat. Exactly. Oh, okay. I remember that now. Okay. Next favorite episode, Johnny was The Wild Weekend with Jack Wild from Puff and Stuff and Oliver. He spends the weekend with you guys. Now, was this a brilliant Crop Brothers in-joke, or was anyone else, you think, considered for Jack's part? Oh, no. What happened is um, I was singing at um, the uh, Hollywood Bowl. Right. And, and Jack was one of the stars that was a part of the croft show at the hollywood bowl so they decided to keep jack you know flying him over from london they decided to give him another role in the and wrote an episode with him in it right and i know um whoops okay back to me I know that I didn't mention the Hollywood Bowl thing. The Croft, uh, the Croft uh, characters appeared at the Hollywood Bowl, and there was skits, and you sang, you sang Friends to a very enthusiastic crowd. You also told a kind of funny worm joke who couldn't yes. tell his front end from his back end kind of thing. So um, 
But you were used to being in front of crowds, obviously. Right. Uh, and the Brady Bunch kids were also in that singing. Sunshine Day, <laughs> whatever, right. they, whatever they sang. Right. Okay. Let's move on to some more favorite episodes. Now, of course, if Jack Wilde shows up from, uh, from Puff and Stuff, why not actually bring Puff and Stuff in? And so the episode was called Puff and Stuff Drops In. Uh, and then because Sheldon, uh, the genie, zaps him into the clubhouse. Was this just uh, to do a crossover kind of thing? What, what was the idea behind that? You know, um, paying homage to their first big show, I suppose, of the Crofts. Right. Okay. And, you know, that, ma that makes sense. Some more uh, use out of this expensive costume. <laughs> right, exactly. It's the second season. We don't. We have minimal to use. We've got the old puff and stuff costume uh, that wasn't burned, thank God. So let's uh, let's give him an episode. And then finally, last but not least, my I mean, I mean these are some of my favorite, not all of them. Sure. Was haunted house. We'll show once again Zelda and the sheriff. Uh, they go to see a movie. Uh, not Zelda. Um, Gertrude. Um, well, anyway, you get the sheriff takes Zelda out. Yeah, I don't Fran, have to. Fran, yeah, Fran Ryan played the part of Gertrude. Gertrude, Gertrude, yes. And so the oozes sneak into the house. Maybe they're looking for some potato chips. Who knows? A hilarity ensues. Everyone's bumping into each other. So I just remember the, you know, the Haunted House episode. Um, but there were many more great episodes, obviously, with Sheldon. You guys uh, fly on a magic carpet. Um, you know, stuff like that. So what, what would you say your favorite Sigmund episode was? Well, my favorite one was um, the Halloween episode. Oh, the one we just showed. Yeah. Right. Only because that's where uh, Margaret Hamilton was in that episode and Sigmund was able to be seen by more than just Johnny and Scott. Oh, right. Exactly. Okay. So that, that's our take and tribute on um, Sigmund. But I want to kind of segue into uh, my next talking point. You were a, a, a full-on uh, teen idol by this point. Obviously, you graced all the teen magazine covers like Tiger Beat with fellow, uh, I guess, heartthrobs Donny Osmond and Bobby Sherman and the like. Now, Screaming Girls were waiting for you uh, at the mall when you did public appearances. Now, was that a good thing that you enjoyed or, or was it a hassle or was it even scary at times? Well, I was kind of used to it from doing the, uh, um, the, the uh, fashion shows that I had done with Elder Manufacturing Company and the Tom Sawyer line of clothes. And we continued that through Sigmund and then, of course, when Sigmund ended, my contract with the Elder Manufacturing Company ended. But, um, no, it was, uh, um, fun. All part of a day's work, you know. And I, I liked it, of course, being admired and screamed at by, you know, fans. Johnny, or, Johnny. Right. <laughs> I can just imagine. So, after the success of Sigmund and its initial run ended, it was, um, it was still seen, I guess, at least on, for reruns for the next 10 to 15 years. Right. And I read that you were, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you were kind of burnt out at this point with the whole acting thing. I mean, you've been doing it since you were three. So maybe age 16, 17, you wanted to be a normal teenager and even go to college. So expand right. on well, that. What happened is in 1976... Uh, Sigmund had done its three years, and that summer I was asked by a show promoter to do the Johnny Whitaker show. And with that, my younger brother and two younger sisters would do the Johnny Whitaker show at um, state fairs all around the, the western United States. And while doing that, uh, for the bicentennial... Uh, Anissa Jones died of a drug overdose. And I found out about that while I was in Salt Lake City at my sister's home where we were staying while we were preparing for um, the Johnny Whitaker show in Salt Lake City. 
and um, it kind of threw me for a loop. And I told my agent to kind of cool things down and not go after a whole lot of work, but only something that would be really good. And um, so, you know, the roles were coming in or requests, but she turned down most of them until uh, another series called Mulligan Stew came around. And I did the um, pilot episode and then NBC, who I had thought I had a good relationship from Sigmund, told the producers that they wanted to X me and get another boy to play my role. And so it went on for like six or seven episodes, and then it was canceled. How weird. And to this day, you don't know why, right? Okay. So before we move on uh, to the my next topic... I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, not only am I a, uh, a pop culture historian and an author and an archivist, I'm also, I guess, the archivist for the Bob McAllister archives. I previously okay. did a show on Wonderama where we showed rare clips, and it was that great kid show from the 60s and 70s that had skits and games, and if you're watching, you can check that out on YouTube on a previous episode, but Johnny... I have a rare photo of you. You were, uh, I think it was either 75 or 76. You made an appearance on Wonderama. And Bob talked to you and interviewed you, and you also appeared in some skits. So let's take a look at that photo uh, right now. Is that the first time you've seen that? I've not seen that. I mean, yeah, look at that. Interesting. You know, all mature, and I guess, uh, how old are you there, about 16, 17, maybe? Yeah, probably 16, looking at the... The, uh, the haircut? <laughs> haircut and the uh, uh, Nehru jacket or whatever. Right. <laughs> so do you remember anything about Bob? Any memory you could share? I wish I could see that episode, because I don't remember... I remember having done it, but I don't remember it that well. Yeah, it's tough to find because Metro Media, unfortunately, what they did with a lot of TV shows back in the day is they erased over them or they tossed them into the East River. So only a few episodes remain. Unfortunately, yours isn't one of them. It would be right. so cool to see that. But uh, no, the kids loved you from what I read because I have some of the show notes and you just had a good time. So um, yeah, there's, there's I wish, your... I, wish, I remember that very well but i don't remember exactly what was going on right no you did you what he did is there'd be a couple of skits and um like there was one skit you appeared on tell me if you remember you had to wear all these different clothes uh and necklaces and hats and you were backstage and they'd show just a flash of you for a second and the and they bob would pick two kids who had to remember what you were wearing and the, the more okay. they, they remembered they won a prize <laughs> so that was a great, great thing. Okay, so many years pass, and um, in the in the nineties and two thousands, you appear on some uh, retrospective uh, documentaries like "Where Are They Now" and the the E True Hollywood Story and, and Child Stars, and you pretty much got out of acting. And I, I saw your Tom Snyder uh, Late Show appearance, which is awesome. And you mentioned you were a computer consultant with CBS. And then later you joined uh, your sister's talent agency, Whitaker Entertainment, right? Right. And you had some uh, well-known clients, including Dana Plato. That's a trip. Were you managing her at the time when, when uh, she passed? Well, yes, I was. And basically, at that time, now everything's done by internet and email, but they have um, a special phone line with a uh, text like a like a tty kind of a thing that would come up and <clears throat> it was called break it's still called that today breakdown services and it would be you know there isn't a, a request for a um clown we need a clown to be in this commercial right now, you know, send your people down in their clown makeup as soon as possible. Um, you know, and so 
agents would call up their clowns and say, get your makeup on and get down to Sunset Boulevard uh, and, you know, get on the, the and um, then at the beginning of the day or the night before, they would have a whole list of things that, uh, you know, a book about that, about that, here, there we go, about that thick uh, of different roles that were being looked at for, you know, co-starring or, you know, guest starring or whatever. And across the wires came um, George Clooney looking for the manager of Dana Plato for a movie that he was doing. I think it was Gods and Kings. Okay. And um, he had worked with Dana um, when he did, uh, I don't know if he did Facts of Life and or her show, but he had met her at that time and was kind of enamored by her and uh, wanted her to audition for a role. Well, I didn't know who was her manager, but I hadn't, you know, I looked her up and saw that she didn't have any management according to, you know, our sources. So um, I called, uh, her brother, um, help me with his name. Um, <laughs> I can't. Uh, what you talking about, Willis? Right. Um, he's my friend. Why can't I remember? Anyway, I had his phone number, and I called him, and I said, because uh, his father was also a manager agent, and I didn't want to spill the beans in case. And I said, I'm, you know... There's something that I think is perfect for um, Dana, and I don't know who her management is. Do you know? She goes, no, I don't, but I'll call her and give her your number. And so he did, and she called me back, and I met with Dana and um, sent her on the audition. She did not get that role, but uh, I had another friend who was interested in her playing another role, and brought her in to meet with the producers on that. And we were getting the uh, paperwork done. And uh, it would be a, um, a play that she would be doing summer stock with and going from town to town for like every other weekend. And so she decided to buy a Winnebago and have her son live with her that summer and drive with her through, you know, um, following the, uh, the other cars and, uh, having her own place. And that's when she did the, uh, um, Howard Stern show the Friday before the Sunday of mother's day when she passed. And, um, he did not treat her well and uh she came back to uh um oklahoma where she was living and her boyfriend the creep that he is um she took some pills and uh died of an overdose but um he put a microphone up to her while she was gurgling her last breath and tried to sell that on the internet. Hmm. And instead of calling 911, he, anyway, that was just terrible. That's a horrible story. Um, let's change course a little bit to, uh, I guess, the present day, but it all started um, in the late 80s, early 90s. You were recently quoted as saying, old actors don't die, they go to autograph shows. <laughs> and which is one of the great quotes of all time and it's ab it's absolutely true johnny uh the rise of the convention or the con as they call it has truly breathed new life into the career of many uh retro actors and celebrities such as yourself now i'm an old school autograph show junkie from the early 90s where stars like you and jay north dennis the menace 
a few of the little rascals like Butch and Dorothy, and even old cowboy stars, uh, and many other memorable faces would appear at an autograph show, like the uh, Hollywood Collector Show in Burbank, which was a favorite of mine. Uh, you guys would sign photos and, and meet your fans. Let's see if I can uh, find a photo of UI and uh, Kathy. There we are. This wow, is around 1990, 91, 92. <laughs> so that's great. You were kind enough to let me stand behind you. Now you would ask me for 100 bucks to stand behind you. You wouldn't, but the stars would. And that was my point. Back in the day, the prices were decent. 5, 10, 15 bucks for an autograph, maybe 5 bucks for a photo. It was very humble. And that, that's the show that I liked, where it wasn't taken over by the people sitting at the table with the cash box who are only interested in, in making a dollar. Uh, what do you recall of those early autograph shows with uh, Kathy? And uh, did you enjoy meeting fans and reminiscing? Oh, well, you know, the, the autograph shows are lots of fun because it is human nature that we like to be appreciated um and be told thank you and be told that you're loved um all parts of a you know healthy relationship with the rest of humanity and so for me to be in that um situation where they fly you into a city and you sit down and meet friends and fans uh from long time ago and who say you know you saved my childhood or you know your show was what took us away from being beaten by our parents or uh you know some very positive some very negative um stories that i've you know heard but all in all it's it has always been a wonderful opportunity to meet up with um people who I only saw from the inside of the TV. <laughs> right. But that I got to, uh, you know, meet in person. And, um, you know, I, the last um, show that I went to, well, the Hollywood show. Oh, great show. Um, was a great show and lots of friends there. But um, my best friend and roommate, uh, his mother's, one of his mother's favorite shows was um uh the jeffersons mm. and um i got a picture with me and what is it 222 what room 222 no oh <laughs> um who played the the maid oh see now you got me on that one john anyway i got a picture of her signed to my my best friend's mom and uh she and me and my roommate we got a picture taken with her and it was just super to give to his mom uh my mother is passed so i steal my best friend's mom as my mom right uh, for now uh, for mother's day and she was just thrilled but uh being able to have those people and those friends around uh, make it a wonderful opportunity. Well, those. Oh, and yes. I took my picture with uh, Charo. Oh, Coochie Coochie Coo. Coochie Coochie Coo. And right. I spoke Spanish with her, and she goes, How come you speak Spanish so well? She looks good. She still looks good. Just like when she was on the Hollywood Squares. Um, so, Johnny, as I said, autograph shows are fantastic. Um, but as I said, now they've kind of become bigger events. But to take a step back, there was an event that wasn't huge, but it was still wonderful. And it was uh, near Oakland called CroftCon. And it was the first one ever where you and uh, Butch Patrick and Wesley Ewer and uh, Kathy Coleman and the Croft brothers and Sharon Baird and Puff and stuff all appeared. And you met your fans and you signed autographs and it was it was well overdue and from the videos I've seen on YouTube a good time was definitely had by all and kudos to, to the guy who owns the theater where it was all held uh, for putting it on. Tell me how the CroftCon was for you and does my idea to take it more national make sense or should it stay more low-key? 
Well, I know that um, Marty was not as excited about doing it um, because he and uh, hold on just a second. Got to oh. bring up my little. We'll show her in a second. Go ahead. Anyway, how did you know? <laughs> And now she's there's the promo but, for uh, it marty sid and marty you know sid is 94 years old which is incredible and marty is not far behind him but he's like 85 or 86 and um marty was not going to do it because sid was asked first and he doesn't like to be second a little brother rivalry going on there yes and it's been happening for 70 years, I guess, but um, realized that um, it was a great opportunity to, you know, show. One of the cool things that happened was within the theater, they showed um, episodes from all of their shows, and they have now a, um, uh, a curator of the Croft um legend and uh he gave a, a a history lesson at the beginning of the con which was just really really good for people who uh would want to see and hear what was going on um they uh he, he did an excellent job and then each of us who were there would share a little bit about the story or our connection with sid and marty and then they would show an episode and then we would talk about it and so you know that's what i thought was most interesting uh, I'm, I'm happy to sign autographs and meet with the fans but the thing that was most interesting to me was having the uh having the stories and background and uh, all of the um yeah, kind of like kind of kind of like what you're doing for us today. Yeah, right. And and what do you think? Stay there or move to L.A. or New York? Well, I think that they can do it in a couple different cities. Oh, okay. Like That's a touring what, a touring con. Yeah, Marty had Marty had said this is just the beginning, John. <laughs> um, but of course, it did cost the Croft people quite a bit because they had to. They brought up two vans full of costumes and memorabilia and you know they sold the memorabilia and and all of that um so you know i'm sure that it was kind of a break even for them but um it was it was great and it was you know highly um there were people who came there was at least 50 people who came in from out of town mm -hmm. uh who were uh who flew in anyway and stayed at the the hotel and um then there were others who drove up for the day from los angeles and others who um came from you know far and wide and drove in or um so there was quite a few uh fans from outside the um san francisco area right. and you know basically it was only about 30 minutes from san francisco so um it wasn't too bad right so if you were a frisco fan it was just a simple driver if you lived in oakland it was even it oh, was yeah. even better so as i said a good time had by all and uh, it was great watching the videos and stuff you got, i think you sang all the theme songs there which is great so um, before we go, John, tell us well, what you've been doing for, I guess, the last 20 years or any important projects that you have uh, coming up. Well, um, I'm currently in, if you go to johnnywhitaker.com, um, I try to update that as often as I can. And um, I'm uh, my next uh, appearance is going to be at the 50th anniversary of the filming of the film Tom Sawyer in Arrow Rock, Missouri over the 4th of July weekend. Wow. Um, and uh, then I'll be in Kanab, Utah for the 
um, cowboy legends um, celebration uh, where they celebrate me being there for the um, the two episode gun smoke that I did and other um, episodes of other uh, westerns mm -hmm. but it's the western roundup in Kanab Utah which is right across from uh, Page, Arizona, and uh, the uh, Grand Canyon. But uh, the uh, other, then, on uh, the 31st of uh, August is International Overdose Awareness Day. Okay. And um, every year for the last 12 years, this will be the 13th year, I have celebrated um, that, and this year on June 10th, I'm going to celebrate lives lost and lives recovered. Uh, September is international is the United States uh, um, recovery month for people in recovery. I am 24, almost 25 years clean and sober from all mind altering substances. Oh, congrats! And I am a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, and uh, nationally recognized and specifically in the state of California. And um, anyway, for that, uh, I'm going to have a Zoom meeting where all of the fans and friends are welcome to join us, and especially those who um, have friends or family that have passed from an overdose. Um, Butch Patrick, my friend, is going to join us. Uh, to talk about lives recovered and how he recovered from uh, his addictions. And um, we will also be celebrating the lives lost of those who lost their lives in uh, because of overdose. Oh, well, that's, that's to be commended exactly. It sounds like you're doing a lot of positive things, uh, Johnny, and it, it makes me happy to know that you have a a loyal base of adoring fans who love you. Oh, yes. and yes. Uh, if you go to um, johnnywhitaker.com, I'm in a new series called um, The Last Evangelist. Oh. Where I play uh, a the bishop of the only authorized religion 20 years in the future. That's a trip. Well, wow, everybody go check that out. Um, I was just saying your fans love your movies. Uh, family Affair, of course. They love Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. I personally am was honored to have you here. I can't thank you enough for well, being here. Did, did you have a good time, Johnny? Absolutely. Awesome. Well, uh, I just want to wish you the best of luck in, in all your future endeavors and nothing but good health and happiness. I just want to also thank uh, all of our followers and fans of the, uh, of the podcast. Uh, this was a another edition that we've wrapped up of the Retro Time Machine podcast. We've been talking to the great Johnny Whitaker, and uh, I want you all to join me next time when we discuss all things retro and we talk to some of the grooviest stars of the 70s. So for Johnny Whitaker, I'm Jay Jennings. We'll see you next time on the Retro Time Machine podcast. Thanks, Johnny. Thank you. Bye-bye.